hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Okay, we want to welcome those online tonight to our next webinar entitled Rotating on the Urology Service, Facts and Strategy for Medical Students. This is January 27, 2020. This is the Medical Student Education Committee for the American Urological Association. Next slide, please. Let's get started. My name is Dr. Seth Cohen. It's very nice to see you. Welcome. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Division of Urology and Urologic Oncology at City of Hope in Southern California. Uh, I've been a moderator on a few of these sessions, and we're going to continue, and I'm going to continue in that role. I want to welcome our fantastic panelists this evening. Our first panelist is Dr. Gina Badalato. She is an assistant professor of urology at Columbia. She's also the director of the urology medical student courses, and she's also uh, very much involved in academic urology. Our next panelist is Dr. Kathleen Kieran. Dr. Kieran is a pediatric urologist at Seattle Children's. She's an associate professor at the University of Washington and also very involved in academic urology. We're very fortunate this evening to have medical student panelists and recent urology matched applicants. Our first is Kyle Zuniga. So Kyle is a fourth year medical student at Columbia. Um, he is just matched at UCLA, yay. We're very happy for you, Kyle, congratulations. Our next medical student is Vincent D'Andrea. I hope I said that right, D'Andrea. Yep. Fourth year medical student, that was it good? Okay, um, he's, a, he's yeah. a, a fourth year medical, thank you. All right, Vince, perfect. He's a fourth year medical student at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and he is matched at Brigham and Women's. And once again, very happy for you, congratulations. Okay, learning objectives this evening. We are going to strategize, our objectives for you are to learn to strategize and prepare for upcoming urology sub-internships, discuss common urological consults and resources available to, to sub-interns, and describe common expectations for sub-interns and strategies to excel. The AUA info this evening. Okay, so these are just websites that you can access for additional information after we finish here. Okay, and these are gonna be, this slide, this presentation will be archived and available for you. We've had previous webinars and our most recent one was how to navigate the urology application process. We had a fantastic discussion back in February of 2018. We would encourage you, um, or actually this would have been February in 2019, we would encourage you to go back and, and, and look at that. Okay, let's get right into it. Timeline for applying to sub-internships, okay? Um, there are some things you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about that. Let's go, let's go right to our medical students. Vince, what would, you, what would you say for people thinking about timeline applying for sub-eyes? So honestly, I think it starts right around now if you know that you're going into urology or if that's something you want to pursue. Uh, one thing that I did find quite uh, annoying is going through the health records. I think going, doing the sooner the better. Um, understand that not all programs use the standard form. Um, and you don't want a missed MMR vaccine when you're you know, two years old to be the reason you didn't get a grade away rotation. So just keep that in mind. Excellent. Kyle, what would you add to that? Yeah, thanks. Happy to speak to it. So um, some of the things I would start looking at is going through all of the program websites that you might be interested in and just kind of taking note of all of your deadlines. So I myself made an Excel sheet that just had that information as well as the contact information of program directors and the program coordinators um, just so I didn't miss anything. And also, you know, if you do end up missing a deadline, um, you know, you should reach out to the program coordinators and directors to see if they'll make accommodations because oftentimes they will help you out with that. Excellent. Dr. Kieran, what would you add? Um, I would echo Vince's comment on not starting early. I mean, if you're basically, if you're thinking about doing an away rotation, then you should be thinking about when you're going to do it and starting to think about a plan. It does take a lot of time to get the administrative task together. Um, the health records were mentioned, but also you need to update your CV. You need to have your letters of reference from people and all of those things being dependent on other people takes a lot of time. So really, just get started as soon as you can because it takes three or four times as long as you think it will. Excellent. And Dr. Badalato, anything else? I agree with everything that's been said. And I think that when you're looking at sub eyes, each, each department has a different policy. Some accept people on a rolling basis. Some look at individual applications. You want to identify people at your home institution that can write you a strong letter. And then when you're applying, just diversify the months for which you're applying. Many places start as early as June and then end in September. So if you're applying to 
they'll they'll have you rank months in order of preference. They'll just be aware of what month you ranked as high priority at a certain program, and then when you're looking for your second sub I, make sure that the order is different so that the dates that you get accepted don't overlap. Very nice behind the scenes insight there. So this is an example of a 2020 urology match timeline. Just to give you a sense, urology falls under a quote unquote early match, right? So the registration opened in June, on June 12, 2019. The deadline for registration for the match was on December the 20th. You actually could start making your rank list within the online portal on November the 13th. And your last day to change that rank list was January the 2nd. Then obviously the, the, the match just happened on January the 17th. So, so urologists, uh, for all intents and purposes, match before most everybody else, which is kind of why you got to start, you got to start thinking ahead when you're planning out your sub eyes, because you want your sub eyes early. You don't, you know, maybe some of the panelists will talk about it, but doing a sub eye in October, you know, it's probably questionable about, about the benefit of that for you, because your, your letters of recommendation already kind of have to be being authored or done. So let's talk a little bit about a way rotation application strategy, all right? And that there's a few, there's a few really important kernels of information in here. Let, let's start with Dr. Badalato this time. What can you, what can you add about this, Gino, way rotation application strategy? Yeah, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you should look at places um, that you honestly would be interested in training for and that you're a good fit for based on your academic profile. Your advisor at your home institution should really review everything, your academic performance, your board score, and um, help you review any feedback that you got from um, um, your clinical year to help you choose a location. I think that targeting, you again, when you do the sub I, you, it opens up doors potentially not only in the sub, in the place where you do the sub I, because they get to know you very well, and if you do a great job, they may they'll likely want to retain you, but also the schools in the neighboring area may take a closer look. I know for at least the New York section, when we see um, a student that has done other sub eyes in the New York area, we consider them as potentially someone that would be interested in coming to our program, especially if maybe they have no history of uh, prior training in New York. So keep in mind the geography too, and doing a sub eye in the areas and locations that you're very interested in. Excellent. Okay, Kyle, what would you add to this? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Badalato said. I think um, strategizing your geography is super important because programs definitely look at that. Um, if you've never been to a place before, never lived in a place before, um, it's really, and if you want to go there for residency, it's really important to, you know, reach out to those programs and do sub eyes there. Um, I would say in terms of reputation, I mean, if you consider yourself not the most competitive applicant, I would still say in terms of sub eyes because they take more sub eyes than they do off residents, obviously, I'd say shoot for the moon. Um, because worst thing that can happen is that you make connections at the program, they maybe develop an interest in you and um, you get a letter of recommendation from a strong faculty member. Um, and then the other thing I like to emphasize is timing. Um, I think if you are really interested in a program, um, it's better to do the sub-I later than earlier. I mean, if you think about the programs are making their match lists in December, um, if you do a rotation in June, it's very different in terms of their memory of you than if you did a rotation in September or August. And then, of course, as Dr. Cohen said, just doing those, if you want a letter from the institution, doing a rotation before applications go out. Excellent. No, that's really good insight. And Vince, what, do, what would you like to add? Yeah, I would say that this is a really good time to, when you're strategizing for away rotations, to start thinking about, you know, kind of what you're looking for in a program itself. Urology is kind of unique in that there's a very wide variation in the types of residency programs you can go to whether it's a five versus six year program, whether that program is very heavy in research uh, versus very clinically based, um, you know, the profile of the residents, how they interact with the, the other services. So I, I would use this time to think about kind of what you value and what you're looking to achieve in a residency and then kind of use that lens to try and choose away rotations that, that fit, fit that princi those principles. Okay, thanks very much. Dr. Kieran, what would you like to add? Uh, I don't have much to add to this. I think that the one other thing is just really, it's been alluded to, but urology is a small world. So it, no matter what you are auditioning, um, you know, you are trying out programs, trying out cities. So um, just think about that degree of flexibility, as Dr. Badalato said, um, maybe 
you can't, you won't get the exact sub eye that you wanted in New York City, but if you try out New York City and like other sub eyes, those still might indicate options for you. So uh, just maintaining flexibility when thinking about it is important. And I, you know, I want to jump off something Vince brought up really quickly about there being a large diversity in the in the in the makeup of programs. I think that's really true. But what I would also add is that what's really amazing about the specialty of urology is I think they're all fantastic programs. It's a small enough community, um, and it's a it's it's a it's a well directed and well regulated enough specialty that all the programs bring, bring a high caliber of training and a high quality of training, which is really fantastic. I mean, you, you can really depend on your colleagues coming out, I, I hate to say it, really darn good at what they do on the whole, to be honest with you. Um, let's keep moving here. Uh, our next slide, all right, this is uh, looking at, let's see, resources for planning away rotations. All right, so so let's let's go to, to Kyle for this question. What, what are some resources for planning away rotations, Kyle? Uh, yeah, definitely, so um, I think, First and foremost, just kind of strategizing, going to a place um, that's going to be affordable for you. Um, if you're interested in the West Coast, for instance, but you have no particular preference for a program, if you have family in LA, maybe go for LA so that you have someone to live with. Um, rotating Room is also a great resource for finding housing. Um, and then uh, go through the websites for programs and research different funding opportunities. For instance, a lot of programs have um, diversity scholarships for uh, funding uh, underrepresented students. Um, and so that's a great way to be able to afford doing the away so -wise. Excellent. Vince, anything to add? Yeah, I think it's always good to um, know which hospitals you're going to be rotating at. I know some programs uh, provide you the option to rotate at certain hospitals, and it's great to do uh, research about those hospitals um, just to make sure that you know what you're getting into. So if programs offer um, an option to rotate at different sites, being strategic about uh, where you choose to rotate and who you choose to meet uh, to tailor to your interests, uh, I think is a great idea. Excellent. And and, and Dr. Kieran, anything to add? I, um, I don't have anything specific to add about the resources, but I just related to the different hospitals where you're working at and housing. Uh, make sure you look at that and be strategic about where your housing will be if you have options, because in terms of cost and time, if you're going to different centers, it's a lot of time and travel costs to get to different places. So that this is something I did not do in my away rotation and I deeply regret. So um, be very strategic about where you stay if there's options and make sure you ask about that. Excellent. And Dr. Badalato, anything else? Uh, not much else, just to do obviously do basic reading about the structure of the program, the faculty members in the department, review the website, the hospital website, because many of these places really expect you to hit the ground running. So the more of an orientation that you can do via social media, um, in terms of the website, Facebook, Twitter pages of that department, it's really helpful. Excellent, okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so maximize away rotation interaction. So this is really looking at how to get the most out of your out of your rotational experience. And this is really important, obviously, right? It's a month long interview and you're spending time, effort, money um, and energy to really make this helpful and hopefully educational. So uh, let's let's start. We'll start with uh, Dr. Kieran. Anything to uh, to elucidate here? Sure. I think that it's really critical to understand what the expectations are. And while that sounds very obvious, making sure that you meet with the faculty member and the administrator who are going to be your point people for the rotation, talking to the residents, uh, talking to previous sub eyes if that's an opportunity, understand what the expectations are. So do you need to pre-round? Do what, uh, what do you do in clinic? What do different attendings' preferences are? And all of this can sound a little bit overwhelming, but the better armed you are about what you're expected to be doing, the better armed you are to be able to meet and hopefully exceed those expectations. Um, I'm also a big fan of asking for feedback, uh, not on a daily basis necessarily, but meeting with the people who you hope to um, interact with and have letters of reference from halfway through the rotation. And then if they give you feedback, be receptive to that feedback, change accordingly. Excellent, Dr. Badalato. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I do feel that the dynamic for an away rotation is a little bit different than the home rotation. 
in terms of how they give the feedback and things like that. Because at the home institution, it may be your very first sub-I, and a lot of it's formative, basically to, to, to allow you to continue to grow and become better. But at certain away rotations, I've seen that the feedback given to the students is, is a little bit more limited in that maybe they're looking, you know, they're looking at whether you'd be a good fit resident or not. And um, for that program, and not necessarily providing you with the, you know, the formative feedback that, that I think is necessary to continue to grow. So I do think it's important to continue to solicit the feedback mid clerkship and again towards the end. And this doesn't necessarily need to be from a faculty member. It can be with the resident that you feel comfortable with, that you've worked with, um, and certainly with, um, with the people who are evaluating you. Excellent. Vince, anything else? Yeah, so another thing I'd add is that um, some programs actually have interviews uh, while you're on the away rotation. So while it might seem a little bit early to think about this probably six months in advance, it, it is something to think about uh, when you're going to your sub-internship. Sub um, so start thinking about questions. Why am I interested in, in this program? What makes this program unique and attractive to me? Why did I choose this program? And then other common interview questions like, why am I interested in urology? And you know, knowing your CV really well, going into that away rotation because you might be inter interviewed formally is just something to know. Fantastic, Kyle. Anything else? Uh, no, it's all great. Um, I guess the only other small thing I could add, kind of going off of what Dr. Kieran says, setting up expectations for the faculty, so letting them know, you know, I'm coming here. I'm planning on asking you for a letter of recommendation so that they can kind of have closer eyes on you and your clinical acumen. Um, and essentially like letting them know what you're interested in, like if you're interested in working at a community hospital or with like low resource communities so that they can put you at that type of hospital or if you're interested in going into endo urology so you work more with the stone guys, stuff like that. Yeah, and, and this is all I, I this is all such fantastic input. I, I mean, I guess what I would also add is in, in general, be open, be open to meeting people, be friendly, uh, be, be someone, um, um, the, the trainees, including the residents and the staff, are, are they're they're happy to be around. Uh, you're a productive member of the team. Okay, we're gonna keep moving here. Before we move on, I do want to note that we do have an opportunity for questions at the end of the webinar, and so you'll see on your online portals there is um, um, a link or or a box to send questions. Feel free to send those questions throughout the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, uh, Dr. Badalato and I are gonna get to the end. We'll we'll kind of read out some of those questions to answer from our panels here, from our panelists here. Okay, so what's in your white coat pockets? What are you carrying around on the wards during these rotations? Why, why don't we start with, with Vince on this one? What are you carrying in your pockets, Vince? Uh, so I always found dressing changes and lube to be the most helpful. I don't think, I don't think you're going to be carrying, you know, Foley's around with you unless you're instructed by, by a resident or a member of your team, but definitely have lube on you, especially if you're in an outpatient clinic. Um, and dressing changes when you're doing rounds with the team in the morning, uh, both are invaluable things to have. Very, very nice answer. Kyle, what, what, what do you have in your pockets walking around the wards? Um, yeah, it's just going off that. Um, same like, you know, gauze, tegaderm, paper tape, suture removal kit, alcohol swabs, stuff for Foley management, like Foley caps, uh, lubricant, saline flushes. Um, and then kind of be sure on rounds to be listening to uh, essentially like the tasks that need to be done for the day or if you know like uh, the like post surgical management algorithms for patients so that you know kind of what is going to need to be done on rounds you know if a patient like, had a JP drain placed in the surgery the day before or, like the few days before and that needs to be taken out be sure to have supplies ready to take those out things like that and then you know your standard pocket guides you know everyone loves their weeders um, and then other like you know references for consults and stuff like that that's exactly, and, and your point about um, expecting and anticipating patient care can really set you apart. That's 100% accurate. Okay, let's move on to the next next slide. So how can I be helpful on rounds? This is this is always, you know, you, you think you learn this as a third year medical student, and then you get to a, um, a, a, a urology rotation, which isn't exactly like medicine or perhaps exactly like general surgery, and you're kind of still left asking the same question. So why don't we start with Dr. Badalato. Dr. Badalato, what, what would you say is how uh, um, someone can be helpful on rounds? I think knowing your patient very well is key. Um, 
So basically, I think pre-rounding is really helpful to visit all your patients, um, hear from them what occurred overnight, be present during sign-out when the night resident sign or the person on call covering the night signs out to the daytime person so you're aware of all the events. Um, I think this comment about making the list is important. A lot of times when uh, residents are coming into round, not all the vitals or outputs are up to date. So if you can go and get that information directly from the nurse or the staff taking care of that patient so that the information is as accurate as possible um, when it's presented is really helpful. Um, seeing consults, I think that this is helpful in, in that your consult note may not be perfect, but I think going and doing the initial triage when, when a patient, when the, when the service has a consult and starting the note and coming up with a tentative plan, both for consults and for inpatients, is really what impresses me most, that they're able to gather the information to interpret it and actually come up with an accurate plan based on that. So I think that that's a higher level of uh, presentation when the plan is accurate. Excellent. Dr. Kieran, what would you add? Um, I would echo the need to pre-round and to personally talk to the patients, but also the nurses and anybody who is taking care of them overnight. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about people in the department or the division where you're rotating, but um, nurses, advanced practice providers, those are also, uh, a, you're going to interact with the, these people on a daily basis. And so th these people can make you look like a star or they can sync your uh, your rotation. So they're a great way to get your primary information. The other thing that I love when anybody does is look at the um, medication administration record, the MAR, and not just what a patient is supposed to be getting, but what they actually got. You would be amazed how many times um, you can look so smart because you realize that somebody got the wrong medication or they have a medication that should be there that isn't there. Really being aware of what's going on with your patient, not just what should be happening, will make you really stand out. Okay, no, that's fantastic. Kyle, what would you add to this? Um, yeah, and so I think Dr. Bottle and Dr. Kieran touched on like the major points that you really want to focus on. Because you know, as a sub I, as a higher expectation, you need to be like an, a, a member of the team that's like operating like an intern and a member of the team. So um, another thing that you know can help you stand out and shine a little bit more is. Um, Beyond the patients that you're following, just listen to the plans for all of the patients that are on the service and identify things that you, you know, as a medical student can do. So if a patient needs to go for CT that day, you know, you can call down to radiology and make sure that they're going in the morning so that that gets done early. Um, if a patient's getting discharged, volunteer to write that discharge summary. Um, if a service needs to be consulted, volunteer to make the phone call or send the page. Just small things that like that that take some of the floor work burden off of the uh, junior residents uh, can make a huge difference and really leave an impact. Such, such such high yield points there. And Vince, anything else before we move on? Yeah, these are all great points. Um, and I think we have great guidelines here, but the only thing I'd add is just to make sure not to overstep your bounds. You know, don't, don't pull a Foley or a drain without explicit permission. Um, I know that sounds obvious, but I'm sure people have gotten in trouble in the past because they thought it was the right thing to do and, and didn't go over didn't go over it with the team so just just making sh make sure that everything that you do is authorized by the team and make sure that you're clear about your expectations so, so you don't do something that you regret no that's that's so important and, and so, you know in a post cystectomy patient perhaps with two with two drains make sure you're you know do yourself a favor be very detail oriented about what you're doing when it comes to what's on the patient and drains and care you don't want to you don't want to accidentally remove the wrong thing i it sounds silly i know but but even in the best of circumstances these little things can make such a difference when when you're on when you're on a rotation like this okay well let's move on to uh, the next slide high yield topics for away rotations Okay, so so why don't why don't we start with uh, Dr. Batalato? So what do you think are some high yield topics for away rotations, Dr. Batalato? Yeah, I think we have several of these topics listed here: how to troubleshoot difficult fully catheter placements, familiarity with Coudet catheters, council tip catheters, and when um, and understanding um, a hematuria catheter. Um, that's not necessarily difficult catheter placement, but falls under the next topic for the evaluation of hematuria and gross hematuria. Um, first line 
uh, evaluation for renal colic and the differential diagnosis for scrotal pain as listed are really all important. And I think that the AUA core curriculum does a really good job of outlining the basics for each of these topics and can provide a great foundation to for further reading, as Kyle mentioned, through readers um, or other resources about um, really the key aspects of management for these conditions. These are really for uh, floor management and ER management and consult management, um, but we'll discuss a little bit more, some, some resources for the main operating room would, would obviously be more familiarity with, the, with anatomy, reviewing your netters, and maybe Hinman, Hinman's Atlas of Surgery for basic understanding of uh, surgical steps. Excellent. And then, and then, Dr. Kieran, what would you add to this as far as any, any, or any, or would you add anything for this discussion, high yield topics? Oh, the only thing I would add as a pediatric urologist is embryology. Kind of, oh, kind of, of course. <laughs> goes along with the anatomy. And uh, obviously, you won't necessarily be discussing this on rounds, but um, obviously, many problems are congenital. So just make sure you have a, an understanding. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And then, Kyle Mintz, anything here before we move on? We're good. Obviously, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying they, they touched on really great points. I think the biggest thing for this is to um, utilize materials that are really concise. So like the, I use the uh, AOA core curriculum a lot. It gives a bulleted list. Um, actually, within, within each major uh, chief complaint, it has a bulleted list of different things to consider. And so like if you have an iPad or something, it's a great thing to just pull up in the elevator on your way down to the console um, and just really finding uh, concise uh, material for uh, uh, these consults. It's great. Yeah, and might add, we're referencing the core curriculum for medical students, not the resident core curriculum for medical students, which is um, freely available and actually you can uh, use it through an, a, a downloadable app for your phone. So it, it, you, everyone should have, you know, have this at their fingertips. Exactly, exactly. And I, I, I want to echo that and completely agree with it. Okay, we're going to move on to the uh, the, the next slide. How do I shine in the OR? Oh man, such such an important discussion. Why don't we start with Dr. Kieran? What are the tips for how do you shine in the operating room? Okay, um, so I, I think I have two big tips. Um, the first one is really know why this patient is having this surgery with the surgeon right now. So that will tell you a great deal about um, the pathophysiology and also the other considerations that go into the surgical and medical decision making. Um, so be very clear about you understand the pathophysiology, but also why this patient is here. Um, why are they in an academic center versus a community center uh, or a surgical center? Uh, all, all of those things are really important. The other thing, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, um, Vince had alluded to this earlier, don't overstep your bounds. Um, I don't want to make it sound very negative, but be sure you're interested and engaged, but don't cut a suture, don't cut anything, don't do anything unless you're asked to and directed to do so. That is, um, I, I've unfortunately seen that happen to people over the years and that's a, a great way to unfortunately make a negative impression. Total, yep, totally true. And doc, Dr. Bottolato, anything to add here about shining in the OR? Um, I think that you know, being aware of the environment and when it's appropriate to ask a question or to engage in conversation versus when it's appropriate not to speak is is kind of um, something that you you learn along the way, but it's very important because you want the surgeon to make, be able to maintain their focus um, at certain key portions of the procedure. I think that students feel like a pressure that they need to ask a question at some point to show that they know their stuff and that they're engaged. But sometimes you show your knowledge in other ways, like knowing, you know, how to retract, how to, you know, how to expose an area if you're doing something like that, or just being able to answer the questions or being able, when the surgery is over, to ask really uh, smart questions about the patient's post-op care. So it, you, you know, um, just walking in with knowledge about the, the, the patient specifically and the nature of the surgery itself, you're equipped to handle anything that may come your way. Fantastic. Kyle, how, how do they shine in the OR? 
Yeah, uh, so <laughs> kind of going off of what uh, Dr. Kieran was talking about, I think as a medical student, I remember it was very, very difficult to find a healthy balance between being an ambitious go-getter and kind of knowing what boundaries uh, need to not be crossed. And so the best way to go about solving that problem is to just be really communicative about what you are doing or are about to do. Um, and so in the OR, you know, know the case, uh, prepare, like watch videos, like read Medscape, read Hinman's if you got it. Um, and then pay really attention, close attention to what's going on in the surgery and try to imagine, you know, if you were the surgeon, what would you need someone to do that would make it helpful? And so if you see them pull out sutures, you know, ask for scissors. Don't cut until they show it to you, but ask for scissors and have it ready in your hand to show that you're ready to go. Um, if the visual field's small, ask for a retractor. Don't go shoving things in, you know, let them know what you're doing if you're gonna do that, but just be ready. If there's a lot of bleeding, ask for gauze, ask to grab suction, stuff like that. Um, and then there are some basic expectations in terms of surgical skills that a lot of sub-eyes should have. So some stitches to practice are like very like simple closures, port closures, stuff like that. So simple interrupted sutures, horizontal mattress, subcuticular sutures, and all, all stuff you can learn how to do through like YouTube videos and stuff. Very good. Vince, what else? Yeah, all excellent points. Uh, the only thing that I would, I, I was really nervous about um, shining technically in the in the operating room and I quickly realized that if you know your fundamentals your basic two-hand ties right-handed and left-handed that that's really just enough to to shine in the operating room um, another point is I think just always be friendly and helpful to the staff in the operating room uh, because you're you're always being watched and I think a negative interaction uh, with the staff, especially in the operating room, can really be looked at negatively. Um, but by and large, and this is something that's really fun about urology, is that the operating room is really fun. Um, so have fun. It's going to be a fun time and, and try and bring a lot of positive energy. Oh, I love that. That's a great, that's a great point. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay, outpatient clinic. Um, this is an interesting thought. You know, you're on a, you're on a rotation, and obviously part of that rotation is engaging in outpatient care. You know, how do you maximize that, or how do you how does it become how do you make it helpful and also educational? Why don't, why don't we start? Well, let's go right to Vince on this one. Vince, what do you think? Well, I think as a as a medical student, we all want to be in the operating room, but I think keeping in mind that this is some of the best face time that you'll get with the program leadership and attendings um, who are important in decision making uh, is something that's really really important. Um, and it's an opportunity uh, for you to shine and show your knowledge, you know, without the mask on. Um, so maybe you could visit somebody's clinic uh, in advance of asking for a letter of recommendation. Um, if you're going to be in an oncology clinic, then reading up on the NCCN guidelines or, or bringing your weeders just to, to know your stuff. I, I actually think that um, the outpatient clinic, although maybe not so glamorous, uh, is a really, really important experience for sub-interns. Very good. Kyle, what would you add to that? Uh, yeah, I totally, totally agree with Vince. This is a great opportunity to network um, and to get to know the attendings a little bit better and make them get to know you a little bit better. Um, so again, kind of going off of what I was talking about in the OR, you know, being ambitious, you know, looking at the clinic list for the day, seeing what the chief complaints are the night before so that you can study up on, you know, what's the differential in workup and management of hematuria, what's the differential in workup for renal colic, things like that. Um, and then asking your attending or the resident on, in the clinic, hey, can I go see this patient? And like being ambitious, go seeing patients on your own, coming back, presenting them. Um, because sometimes that might be your only shot to even present patients and formulate plans to attendings because sometimes they won't join you on rounds. So. Very, very good insight. And Dr. Kieran, anything to add to this? Yeah, um, I, I think I would just echo the uh, previous conversation about asking about expectations because some providers, um, whether you're going in a room by themselves or uh, if they're ear shadowing, they don't want you to write notes. Um, some people will want you to come out and write a medical student note, but different places have different regulations. So just be very clear about if you're supposed to see patients on your own, how much of the exam you should do on your own, how much of the documentation you should do. Um, it will give you a chance to shine depending on what you're allowed to do, but just be very clear about that up front. Um, the other thing is I've, um, and this is, a, this is a personal thing for me, I really love it when medical students come to clinic dressed professionally. And 
coming from the, even if you come from the OR, take five minutes, change into your business casual clothes. Um, it's really important not to um, not to go in and really casual clothes to clinic. So come dress professionally. Very good. And Dr. Badalato, anything else? Um, just that I think that when you're asking for a letter of recommendation, it, it strengthens your letter if the letter writer has experience with you both in the OR and in the clinic, because then they can talk about different dimensions of your performance in both of those different venues. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And also, you know, everyone, uh, there are some providers that maybe have limited time in the, in the Cisto suite or in the main OR. And... Um, it's a great opportunity for you as a student to maybe get to know other members of the faculty that have more of an outpatient type of practice. They're doing neurodynamics or mastectomies or what have you in the office. So um, I think that it's, you know, it's a great opportunity to get, get to know other faculty and also familiarize yourself with many of the office-based procedures that we do commonly in neurology. So true. And you know what, you know what, in my experience, what's been great is, you know, having people in clinic that are facile with the EHR. And, and, and granted, when you rotate at a, at a system, you may be learning the EHR at the, set, at the same time that you may not be used to Epic or Cerner or Meditech or, or whatever, you know, gadget gizmos is out there. But, you know, you'd be surprised if you become facile with that EHR and you've got some smart phrases and dot phrases and everything else, you, you can become a very helpful member of that outpatient clinic very quickly. Um, and, and people recognize that. And so that, that's also just some information. Okay, we're gonna move on to the, uh, our next discussion, preparing for Grand Rounds presentations. Um, okay, uh, Kyle, what was your experience with this, preparing for Grand Rounds presentations? Yeah, so these are an excellent opportunity to kind of demonstrate what you know to typically most of the faculty at the program. Um, so it is a really important, you know, eight to 10 minutes of your life. Um, I would say for these, stick with a topic that you're comfortable and confident in. Um, if you've done research, you should present on that topic or on that research or on your publications. Um, also, if the topic is something controversial, um, like for example, like new imaging modalities for prostate cancer screening, um, research the different sides of the argument and prepare for audience questions um, so that you can provide intelligent answers when people uh, try to grill you. Um, and then don't try to do too much. Uh, pick a focused topic, especially if you only have you know eight to ten minutes for your presentation. Um, so something like pain management after cystectomy is way too broad, but doing something like uh, reducing opioid use with ERAS protocols after cystectomy um, is a much more focused and manageable topic. And then of course we'll workshop your presentation with um, your residents. Excellent, Vince. Anything to add? Yeah, I'd say uh, start thinking about grand rounds early and often. Um, you know, my I, my topics morphed kind of over the course of three weeks when I was on my way rotations. Um, I agree with Kyle. Don't, try not to go off the beaten path too much um, and always run your ideas by, the, by residents and attendings who you think will be uh, good critics. Um, and then finally, practice, practice, practice. Um, I can't stress that enough enough, not just going through your slides and knowing the content, but standing up in front of a mirror and going through exactly how long you want to spend on each each slide. You don't want to drone on and on. You want to be very constrained to your time limit, so make sure to practice. Very good. We're going to move on to the next uh, next slide, unless Dr. Badalato or Dr. Kieran have any um, anything they want to add significantly. Okay, professionalism. So this is a very important topic. Let's let, let's start with Dr. Badalato. What what can you give? What insight can you give regarding guidance on professionalism on rotations, Dr. Badalato? Um, I think number one is um, to look at your co sub interns as you know as your friends, as people that are going to help you, that are going to make you shine, and not as your competitors. I think that when I when I see that there's an unhealthy dynamic between the sub eyes, it concerns me because it, it tells me a little bit about how they interact with others and how they may interact with, with the residents. And I think that I'm very impressed when I see a group of sub interns that not only get along with our residents, but get along with one another and respect one another and want to cultivate that culture. I think also another thing to keep in mind is that 
You know, you're not expected to know everything every single time. Uh, I respect people that say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, or I don't know that right now, but I'm going to look it up, and they come back the next day with that information. And I think it's really important not to lie, um, but to be committed to learning, and I think that that reflects a lot of integrity. And the third point would be to echo what Dr. Kiernan said about looking professional and dressing professional, just um, coming to clinic in professional clothing. It really shows that you know, you have a respect for the environment and, and, and for the patients that you're seeing. Very good. Dr. Kieran, what would you add to this? I would just add that it's critically important to be on time. Um, and that means being in the operating room when your patient rolls in, unless you are um, with, seeing a consult or with the residents or the staff in some capacity, being 15 minutes early for clinic being early um, or on time for grand rounds, being late is not respectful of other people's time. So very important to be punctual. Very good, very good. And Kyle and Vince, anything else to add? Um, I just wanna kind of reiterate and echo what Dr. Badalotto was talking about, about respecting your co-sub eyes and really meshing well with your co-sub eyes. Um, very early in the rotation, I think it's a great idea to set expectations with them, but also you know, go out to dinner with them, hang out with them, explore the city with them, get to know them so that you actually do really enjoy working with them and you get to know them well. Like, It's a great opportunity to meet your future colleagues in the field. Some of the people that I met on my way of eyes will be my best friends for life. Um, there's a lot of really incredible people in urology. Um, and then the other thing about professionalism is, you know, I know as a medical student, it's hard to know like, when do I leave? How do I go? And so the, I think the most important thing is to show up early. Don't leave until you're dismissed. But also, on the other hand, when you are excused, go home. Um, because I've been told specifically by residents that they want to see that you value your time outside of the rotation as well. Um, and so when you have time for yourself, go, leave, relax. Very good. Very good. And you know, I, I you know, I, I just as a side uh, or corollary of some of this discussion, I guess I would say is professionalism. While we're talking about rotational professionalism, be aware that as you're a urology applicant and you have social media, if you have social media that's visible, it's visible to people that are interviewing you and that are interacting with you on rotations as well. So just make sure if the social media is visible to people that that you're interviewing with. You know, just be cognizant that anyone can see that, right? So Twitter, Facebook, what, whatever it may be, just remember there, there's, you know, while, you, you know, you have to be professional in all aspects of your life if the public can see that, if that's a part of who, who you are, because someone may ultimately see that. So just keep that in mind with the social media platforms, okay? All right, so we're going to move on here to the, we're going to start, this is a little bit of a discussion about 2020 AUA match statistics. And so this is just to give you a sense of what happened most recently. And then um, Dr. Badalotto, do you feel comfortable talking a little bit about this? Because you've gone over this a little bit, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, so you can see that these date back from 2013 um, to most recently 2020. From 2013 to 2019, it was interesting because the number of registrations actually decreased and the number of available positions actually increased and that led to one of the highest match rates for U.S. seniors that we've ever seen last year. I think it was about 91%. This year, um, we saw a slight change. Um, the match rate decreased, decreased slightly for U.S. Um, seniors down to 83%. So whether this is an outlier or the beginning of a trend, the new change in the match rate remains to be seen. Um, we don't know exactly what it's on what was the reason the match rate has had skyrocketed at least from 2013 to 2019. It could be that people are self, you know, the counseling that people receive before they enter the match or, you know, different perceptions that people have about the field of urology. Certainly that's something that we want to touch on in this, in this webinar, that this is uh, a career for people that are really interested in, um, a rewarding and challenging profession that's going to address many of the major needs of the U.S. population, um, and um, it's something that we're incredibly excited about. I also want to, you know, draw attention to the bottom line, which shows that this year was a landmark year for for women, 
with an 86% rash rate for women. And I think that this is a um, this is a, a theme in that I think that our professional association is committed towards making sure that we have a diverse cohort of providers on all different levels. Um, and I think that this is something that um, this commitment to diversity is something that is, is going to be a real something of great importance as we continue to recruit the urologists for the next generation. Excellent. Excellent. Um, anything anyone else wants to add on this topic before we move on? It's amazing to see the changes. I mean, you go back to 2013, a 69% match to an 83% match this year. You know, it's competitive. It's competitive, but it's 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 within reach. I mean, you know, I, I personally have never met someone that wants to be a urologist that if they kept at it, didn't become a urologist. And so it's just a question of, of sometimes of how you get there and the in the winding road you take. But but it's it is a it is a reachable dream. OK, um, we are. Uh, so I want you I want the, the webinar attendees to be thinking about questions uh, start if you want to start submitting that because we are moving towards the end of the presentation in the next few slides here uh, we will try to keep the we will we will we will keep the questions anonymous so we're not going to announce your name so feel free to ask questions that perhaps you you know don't worry about who else is going to find out if you're asking that question because we're not going to announce your name to the people that are on the webinar okay let's move on to uh, the next slide here so this is really uh, a demonstration of what's on the AUA website so this is the medical student education curriculum um, which exists as a service to you, the medical students, on the AUA website. And much of this is there is no firewall. This completely can, this can be completely accessed for the most part by anyone who like to go to the website and find it. Um, there's also an app that can be downloaded for medical students as well. Um, and there's even some 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 podcasts as well that can be downloaded potentially too. Now there is there is some quote unquote core content or links within the medical student curriculum to content that is under the AUA core curriculum, which is kind of like for the residents and, and, and practicing urologists. But to be honest, you get that too for free if you become a member of the AUA, uh, you know, if you become a member of the American Urological Association. And what does it cost to become a medical student member of the American Urological Association? Nothing, zero, just sign up. So it's, it is really a lot of reasons to access this, this essentially free curricular education. It's something we do for, for you to excite you about urology. So there is uh, Twitter is something that has become beloved by many urologists. Um, we our community has found it an excellent way to share information and share share research and share um, conference presentations. And so the American Neurologic Association is certainly on Twitter. And there's hashtags that are all around that maybe some of you have seen on the in the Twitter sphere. For instance, we have the AUA meeting coming up in 2020 in Washington D.C. The hashtag for that's going to be AUA20 just like the hashtag for the match was hashtag AOA match. And in general, Twitter is a really wonderful uh, platform to connect and interact with people in urology, interested in urology. And so I, I personally have found it um, a great way to even keep up on journals and articles. Um, anything that any of the panelists would like to add to this? Is there anything that, uh, any insight into social media and urology that, 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 we, that we should relate? Okay, we will move on. Yeah. Oh, it's me. I think it's important, yes, to be cautious about what you post on social media, but I do still think that it is a great resource to learn more about a program. They, they Really, I think a lot of the most current events, the accomplishments of the faculty, the residents, you know, papers, things like that, opportunities in the department are really being advertised a lot through Twitter, Facebook, and things like that. And I have noticed that applicants are on Twitter and using it in a respectful way to, you know, talk about their papers or to support other applicants or support their, you know, people that they've worked with. And it can be, it can be a wonderful, powerful tool if it's used correctly. It's, that's very, thanks for highlighting that. That's so true. Very true. And so this is this slide talks about what we had just mentioned. We have our national meeting coming up in Washington D.C. Uh, in May. Um, a fantastic opportunity to come learn about urology, network, meet people from various backgrounds. Uh, as a medical student, we as our uh, the committee 
the Medical Student Education Committee made a recognition a while ago that we perhaps needed to make the AUA meeting more medical student approachable. And so what we've done is we're actually working on a medical student tract where we actually make recommendations for medical students of uh, different presentations and, and, and topics that really may be most helpful or pertinent for you. And we also uh, have a mixer and we're actually gonna have a panelist discussion this year at the AUA as well, specifically for medical students attending the AUA. So we're very excited about this. There's more to come on it and we really hope to keep it going in years to come, but certainly feel free to keep your eyes open for that because it will be a part of the meeting as well. Of course, as I kind of alluded to, there's many reasons to be a medical student member of the AUA. We're not gonna go through this. We're gonna move right past it actually, but I wanna highlight for you, membership is free, come on. It's free and you get access to, uh, to, to some of these really great educational platforms. We're gonna open it up now for audience questions, okay? And so I, I see a lot of questions coming through. We're not gonna be able to answer all of the questions, but we will make we will do our best to answer a lot of them, okay? And so, I, so I'm gonna start pulling up uh, uh, some of these questions here, okay? Uh, we have a question that's coming in. This was specifically directed towards Kyle. All right. So, uh, Kyle, they want to know specifically what was the name of that book that everybody carries around in their pocket that you had mentioned, Weeders. Could you could you give a little more information about that? Oh yeah. Sorry, we kind of blew past that. Um, that is the uh, uh, everyone just calls it Weeders. Uh, it's the Pocket Guide to Urology. Um, it's a purple book. Um, that essentially kind of has a very like concise breakdown of many of the different aspects of uh, functioning clinically on urology service. Um, it's by Jeff Weeder, um, and I believe it's only available on his website. And so you'll just have to you know Google Pocket Guide to Urology by Jeff Weeder. That's W I E D E R, um, and uh, you can order the book online. Great, excellent. Dr. Badalato, any questions you want to pick out here to, to answer? I just saw a question here. If you have a significant other participating in the match, how do you address a coupled match process? Um, I do think that I'm assuming that the counterpart is also not participating in the urology match. So one person's participating in the urology match and the other is in the national um, residency matching program, which is at a later date. This is always a really tricky situation um, because you will have your match result as a urologist before potentially your partner has their match result. Um, and I think it, it requires advisors at both institutions to look at both of the parties' um, applications and usually targeting cities that are bigger with many programs in that area is something that's valuable um, so that there's more of a range of programs. It also depends on how um, how big the field that the other person is applying in. So there's a lot that goes into this process and I think it's important to engage, you know, engage your advisors for both parties participating at, at at, whatever, at both schools or about at that same school, whatever the case may be. Excellent. We've got another question. I can also, you, oh, please go ahead, yeah. No, I, I can speak as someone who has just gone through this process with a significant other who is applying into another subspecialty in medicine. And I will just, I will acknowledge that it's very difficult and that there, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with acknowledging that you plan to go through this uh, with a significant other or a partner or a spouse, whoever it may be, um, as early as on your away rotation. You know, if you have an exit interview with, with an away rotation, um, feel free to say something like, you know, my partner and I are both targeting this institution. And I had program directors who were very receptive to that um, and even helped you know, contact programs um, to, you know, help my significant other out. So, you know, be, being candid with programs, I think there's an advantage to that instead of, you know, just being completely sweeping it under the rug. Excellent. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. Okay, we've got another question of how should we best navigate applying to different programs with different application opening dates deadlines? Um, is there someone that can provide input for that? 
I guess this is maybe referring to sub eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a little more sense of that. Yeah, because it's, hypoth it's, yeah I, I think you're right, Seth, applying for visiting sub eyes. Um, and that's very tricky because um, they're, the dates of the sub eyes may not align perfectly within one month. Um, and so there may be overlapping weeks. And then also the dates are completely different. Um, so there's sometimes the programs accept people later and there's a lack of security in terms of knowing where you stand with a particular program. And by the time that that result comes out, maybe the time to apply for another program may have elapsed. So it's really tricky, and I won't lie, it's a source of anxiety for me and for the students that I work with and <laughs> during the process because you can't, the dates don't perfectly align. I would say that it's acceptable to, to apply to multiple places, um, you know, for a given month or for different months during the, the, sub, the visiting sub I period. So remember, you can apply for places as early as June and as late as September. Um, and so trying to work with different places during those months, different permutations of months for different places, I think is helpful. I defer to Kyle and Vincent to add to that. Anything to add, fellas, before we move on? Um, I mean, kind of like what I was saying earlier in the seminar, just, you know, start researching the programs early, like create a running list of the contact information and the dates for when applications are due. Again, if you decide down the road, oh, I want to, do a rotation of this program, but you might have missed the deadline, just reach out and try to figure things out. Um, and I would say, honestly, if you are really, really love a program, like, and you have the time, like, if they can only accommodate you in October, like, rotate in October, like, you might as well. And that, that leads us to another question that's on here. Is a sub-I ending in mid-September too late to get a later letter of recommendation? Any thoughts from the panel? Is a sub-I ending in mid-September, too late to get an, a letter of recommendation. I, I well, you can, so. you can, I'm sorry, go for it. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I don't think so, it, because one of the benefits of going to do your sub I in the fall is that in the summer, many times, faculty are on vacation, people are gone for vacations. In the fall, it becomes conference season, so that's its own challenges. But if you come in at that point, if you're upfront about your interest in the program, your intent to seek a letter of reference from them, then I think that at least at our program, we're very open to having people come at, at that time of year. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a detriment. Very good. We're, I know it's I know it's six okay. nine o'clock. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who's that? No, the only other thing I'll add to that is remember that you can update your application even after you submit it. So, you, you know, you can you can submit three letters up front and then and then add a fourth. Um, so I don't I don't think it's too late at all to get a letter of recommendation in mid September, for example. Very good. And I, I was saying I know it's six o'clock and nine o'clock, um, but we're going to keep going. So we have a lot more questions. We're not we're probably going to be on for a few more minutes and we'll take that time. If you stay with us, we'll answer some additional questions here. So uh, we have another question. Any advice about identifying a faculty member to write a letter of recommendation during the away rotation? How So how do, how do you pick that person on an away rotation to write the letter? Any suggestions from the panel? Dr. Kieran, any input for that? Yeah, I was going to jump in, but I didn't want to answer two questions in a row. Um, but, um, <laughs> That's okay. Come on. Provide it. They want to hear it. Let's go. Uh, so I, I would say that, number one, make sure that you have a good rapport and adequate time with that faculty member. So as a faculty member writing a letter of reference, you want to be able to speak about your experience with the student. Um, to earlier points, you want to be able to say that I worked with the student in the clinic on consults in, uh, when we went down to the emergency room when we we're in the OR. And so somebody that you spent half a day with, unless it was a very intense half a day, probably isn't the right choice to let her write a letter of reference. Um, I would try really try to be strategic about who you ask. So for example, if somebody came to rotate at the University of Washington, they'd say, you know, I'm gonna spend a couple of weeks at Seattle Children's. Whom, who will I be working with? Who's gonna be there? Who's not gonna be there? Maybe I'll ask Dr. Kieran for a letter of reference. How can I make sure that I spend adequate time with her two or three days so that she can know me well 
and write a, an informed letter. Very good. Yeah, I will also add that at certain places, traditionally a certain person writes the letter. And so um, it's good to know the culture in that department who usually writes the letter. Um, and um, maybe, you know, that person may be the person that's evaluating you as well. Um, and so I would, again, speak with your advisors um, about who best to ask the letter from, or even, you know, residents that you know and trust who usually sponsors the letters of recommendation from a particular institution, because it may be designated to somebody. I do have another question that I see up here. Sure. People want to know about step two. Is it important to take step two early on? What does the panel think about that question? Uh, so we have a little bit of data on this um, that I've seen. I think, I think it, it. So not everybody takes step two in advance of their applications. I would say uh, probably around 50% of people end up taking step, step two sometime after their their applications are submitted. Now you have to understand some programs actually require um, step two. Uh, so it's, it's a small number of programs, but if you are interested in any of those programs, obviously step two would be a requirement there. However, um, you don't. It, it is not required by the vast majority of programs. So, um, and some people end up taking it during interview season, anyways, or even after interviews. Um, if you feel like you'll do well on step two, if you consider yourself to be a good test taker. Um, then I would say by all means take it, um, but it's not required for the majority of programs. Very good. Any other questions, Dr. Badalato, you identify that we, we want to answer? Someone had asked where the mixer, the medical student mixer, is going to be for the AUA. That's going to that's two to be determined. We will keep you updated on that. It is going to be at a room with um, an opportunity for some drink, uh, some light drink and refreshments and the panel discussion, but please stay uh, attend, uh, attuned to the AUA website and the conference website and we'll get that updated. And Dr. Badalato, please go ahead. Go ahead. Um, many, I'm seeing many questions about how many away rotations to go on. Um, and and do, do you guys wanna comment, uh, Kyle or Vincent, about the number of away rotations that you did? Yeah, sure, I think it, uh, it's all about your strategy in terms of like what you're doing the away rotations for. I think the average that most people do is they do their home sub-I and then they do two away sub-Is. Um, I think some people who are either trying to spread out their opportunities across the country or might be a little bit more nervous about their competitiveness and their application will maybe try to do a third away. But you know, just keep in mind too your like personal wellness and your health that like, you know, doing these sub eyes are, are a lot of work and it's a month long interview and that can be taxing mentally and physically. And so just, you know, figure out what you are prepared to do and what you actually you know need to do to match and get your letters and all that. And and I would say for the most part for most people it's it's about three total. I agree. I agree. And just understand that doing a doing a, another sub internship could have ramifications for finishing all of your medical school requirement, your own medical school requirements down the road. If you take that time in September when you could be doing, who knows, ICU or a rotation in the emergency department, you know, you might be uh, kicking yourself in, in April when, when, you, uh, when you have to do those rotations. There was a question about navigating a low board score. Uh, is there anything you, you, our team can provide input for regarding navigating questions regarding a low board score? I think that that's, that's tricky, and, and uh, actually, this is something that's an area of active debate and discussion in our community about how we should emphasize, how much emphasis should really be on the board score, because really, many studies have, uh, you know, retrospective studies really haven't shown that it's really predictive of anyone's ability to be a resident um, in terms of the score correlating directly with that. Um, the board score, the USMLE step one score maybe give us some information about um, board passage rates for the for the written exam when you um, when you complete your residency, but there's no, you know, we don't know to what threshold that that matters. Like for instance, 
if you get a 220 on your board, on your USMLE, are you less likely to, to pass your urology board? No one really knows that question. So I think that the emphasis now is really to look at the whole application, look at everything that the, the applicant brings. Um, look at their letters of recommendation, look at their clinical trajectory, things like that. I do think that in many institutions still the, the low, a low board score may hurt with interviews just because some programs use a, a board score cutoff to see which, which, which applications they're going to evaluate and sift through. And to the extent that it, it gives people, um, kind of a tool to, um, to narrow down the applicant pool since there really is no restriction on the number of programs anyone can apply to and there really is a lack of regulation in the number of applications any program can receive, the board score is an easy thing to make that cutoff. Um, I do think that there are ways to overcome that. I think that if you have advisors reach out to institutions and peers at other institutions say, hey, this person may not have met your cutoff, but they're wonderful. Please look, give them another, you know, look. Or if you didn't do well on step one, you make it a point to take your step two early and you do better on that exam. These are all ways to kind of redeem the low board score, but I don't think that it's the end all or be all. It, it, it just makes it a little bit more of an upward climb. Um, in some respects, if you don't, if you have a bad day, but it's not going to discount everything else that you bring to the table and everything that you worked very hard for during medical school. Great, that's that's a superb answer. We're gonna we're gonna try to get to a couple more questions here and then bring it to a close. Um, one question asked for choosing a ways. What would you consider the most important to op to quote unquote open up areas geographically for interviews? I'm presuming West Coast, East Coast. Would it be um, would it be a letter of recommendation from a named faculty member at an institution, or would it be, um, you know, something specific to open up an area of geography to your application process? It, it's a really good question, um, and I think a lot of applicants struggle with that question. You know, if if you really want to be on the West Coast. Um, I, one thing I'll say is that keep in mind that you can tailor your personal statement to each and every school that you apply to. And I did this for a couple of schools that, you know, really were really at the top of my list of, you know, places where I wanted to interview. So when you do actually send in that personal statement, um, if you have a particular reason that you want to be on the West Coast, say, and you have no connection on paper to the West Coast, you know, it might be worth writing a couple sentences at the end of your personal statement to say, by the way, or, you know, acknowledging that maybe you don't have an obvious connection to the West Coast, but that that's somewhere that you really want to be for family reasons, personal reasons, because you really have an interest in the program. So you, you can use that space to to appeal to programs who, who might be out of your geographical quote unquote range. Very good. Any, um, Dr. Badalato, any other questions we want to try to get to on here before we bring it to a conclusion? Um, I just saw the comment, which I liked a lot because it captures everything that we wanted in making this webinar. I just, just want to say thanks to the panel. This has been excellent. You answered all the questions I was afraid to ask, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. Ah, could not be truer. Could not be truer. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to a thank you here, and that's exactly what we want to say. I want to thank uh, our esteemed panel of Dr. Badalato, Dr. Kieran, future Dr. Zuniga, and future Dr. DeAndrea. Uh, congratulations on your matches, and of course, Jody Donaldson from the AUA. Um, this has been a real wonderful discussion, um, and, and we hope been helpful for you. I really wish we could have gotten to all the questions. We can't, unfortunately, but um, you know, this is going to be archived and put on to the website for the AUA under the national, under the Medical Student Education Committee uh, website. So I would encourage you to seek this out later when it's archived and, and rewatch and, 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 and glean as much information from it as you can. We would really love to see some of you or, or many of you at the AUA meeting in 2020 and beyond, because um, as I said, there will be medical student specific um, tracks and events. Uh, but regardless, whatever your path may be, we wish you a, a, a good luck. Um, and, and, and success in whatever you choose to do, whether it's in, whether it's within urology or not, uh, may your future be bright. 
Uh, stay safe out there. And, and thanks so much for, for listening this evening. Uh, and, and, and we will conclude. Thank you very much.